Welcome back to Off World, the show where we talk about all things space exploration and pop culture. I'm Ariel Waldman. And I'm Norm Chan. And this week, Ariel, you and your guests will be discussing and dissecting a film that's notable in a couple ways uh, in science fiction because it's the first Star Trek film. Yeah, so it's 1979, Star Trek, the motion picture, and it really has a plot that, you know, spoiler alert, is sort of centered around real life space exploration that was just around that time as well, the Voyager space probe. And so that's what we're sort of talking about today with Dr. Frank Drake and David Peskovitz. We're going to jump right into space exploration and Voyager and the Golden Record and all these things and sort of how it relates to the movie Star Trek. All right, let's take a listen. Today, I'm with Dr. Frank Drake, the astronomer best known as the father of SETI, the creator of the Drake Equation, and the co-creator of the Voyager Golden Record. And I'm also with uh, David Peskovitz, the research director at Institute for the Future, co-editor of Boing Boing, and Grammy award-winning co-producer of the first vinyl release of the Voyager Golden Record. Thank you both so much for being on the show. Thanks. Our pleasure. Yeah, always happy. So Star Trek, the motion picture, 1979. So we all watched this film again recently. For me, it was actually my first time watching it, but it sounded like both of you had seen it before. Uh, what, what are your general thoughts about the movie overall? Uh, I like that movie a lot. It, uh, <clears throat> it's actually in the background are some very important thoughts about space research and what we might find when we uh, actually detect other civilizations and living things in space. and. Uh, also, just the attitude of the people and their level of education is, is a realistic one. That's, yeah, you know, I, I, I saw that movie when it came out uh, with an uncle who was a big Star Trek fan, and I grew up watching reruns of the original Star Trek, and I remember when I saw it in the theater, you know, when I was probably eight years old, it it honestly aborted the pants off me. Um, <laughs> It's a little uh, slow. You know, but but watching it, especially after watching this, you know, the series, but watching it now again, um, I have an appreciation for it. Um, it's a weird film, really. And you can get this sense of like, you know, these really long shots of with classical music of the of the vessels. It was very um, sort of 2001 inspired. I think, but also this whole mystical kind of side of things. Yeah, well, it also had the same uh, uh, effects uh, person, uh, Douglas Trumbull, Trumbull, who had worked on 2001. Yes. So I could definitely see a lot of 2001 effects in yes. it. Absolutely. That were really cool. I just remember when I was a kid, just remembering that it had the weird bald woman in it. So, <laughs> yes. And she was still in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still are. Never so. seen again. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, let's uh, talk briefly a little bit about uh, some of the work that both of you have done, um, and and it sort of ties into this movie. Uh, Frank, you uh, had worked on the Voyager Golden Record, um, and you know uh, your work with the Drake Equation, even though it was almost two decades before this movie even came out. I feel like sort of informed the movie and informed sort of this this ethos in a sense. Can yep. you talk a little bit about uh, your work on the Voyager Golden Record? And Well, I was in charge of the picture sequence on the Voyager Golden Record. And there we, we, were, we were very conscious of the fact that uh, whoever actually captures this thing, if they do, will be very different from us. And we must take that into account when we choose the pictures we show and the information we give. Because it could be very misleading or it could be... Uh, uh, unclear just what we're looking at. It might even be unclear who the intelligent creatures are and who are the non-intelligent <laughs> creatures. And so this was a, a very great challenge. And uh, we worked very hard to make sure there were no ambiguities and uh, other things that might be very misleading. And I think we did a pretty good job, but it, it was, a, in a way, a lesson to us about uh, what's peculiar about us that we must not be wedded to and what is fundamental, which we should show as, a, as what our civilization is like. Yeah, and, and David, you sort of brought this back to the modern uh, population in a sense. Well, I mean, I think, well, Frank, first of all, is, is underplaying his involvement saying he worked on the pictures. I mean, the reality is that, yes, it was a team led by 
Carl Sagan who put the original Voyager record together, but it was Frank's idea to send a phonograph record uh, to space. A great idea, by the way. Ama- <laughs> amazing you idea. Thank you. And, and, you know, I, I think the, you know, as you mentioned, yes, with, with Tim Daly and Lawrence Azarad, um, we put together a, a vinyl box set, there it is, to, to release the Voyager record um, to the public on, on record for the very first time. And, um, you know, we feel so fortunate to have had that opportunity. And the success of the project ultimately is a testament to the work that Frank and Carl and Annie and John, Annie Drianne and John Lomberg and Tim Ferriss and Linda Salzman Sagan did. That was the, the committee who put this together as a, as a message for any extraterrestrials that might encounter it now or in 300 years as in Star Trek or in a few billion years. Yeah, well, actually, uh, just touching again briefly on the extraterrestrial part, is there the, the Drake equation, could you, for people who are not familiar with it, could you briefly uh, say what the Drake equation is about? Uh, the equation <clears throat> is in a way quantifying uh, what we know about life in the universe and using the, the results of that quantification as an estimate of how many civilizations there are in space that we might detect. It takes into account the picture we have of the histories of Earth, living things and intelligent things everywhere, that the, a planetary system forms uh, on one or two planets are suitable for life, life develops there, Evolution takes place, that's very important, with an end result of creating at least one intelligent civilization which is smart enough to capture the record and, and deduce what, just what the messages are on it. Now, we tried to make that last part easy by using pictures. There's, there's no statements in English or anything like that. That does not work. Uh, you have to use pictures, and we're, in fact, assuming that they see things the way we do and uh, will interpret those images as we do. That may be wrong, but that's all we could do, and we can, even to this day, that's all we can do. So the, the uh, equation simply takes our observational knowledge of the value of all the things, how many stars are there, uh, how many planets in a system, and what fraction might give rise to life, etc., and the end result is the number of civilizations out there that might be radiating some sign of their existence. Maybe radio waves, maybe light flashes, light things. Uh, And in a way, it tells us how difficult the task is, the search, and it is very difficult, and uh, makes us get realistic about how much we should invest in searching if we had, if we we expected to, to succeed in any way. Yeah. So, I mean, going into the movie a little bit, you know, we see Voyager 6 is uh, gone out into space. It's been apparently uh, absorbed and sort of sent through a black hole, which sort of is like a wormhole. It finds other machines, another machine civilization of extraterrestrial machines, and it sort of is sort of bonding with them. It's actually a bit nebulous in both depiction and uh, in plot a little bit, I found. But, uh, you know, this is the idea that there was a Voyager 6. Of course, there was only, so far to date, Voyager 1 and 2. Were were there ever any plans to do more than two Voyagers? No, there were never any plans for more than two, although we have sent many spacecraft since to the planets of the solar system that do just a better job than Voyager did. So, you know, that, that, that line of uh, space exploration is still alive and well. I thought it was really interesting that they actually even called it Voyager 6 because it looked just like Voyager 1 and 2. It just yeah, didn't well, it was. It, was, yeah. Yeah. It, it, didn't have, it didn't have the golden record on it. It had this other yeah. plaque that was sort of this combination of, um, it had your pulsar map there, which shows our location um, in, the, in the galaxy. And then... It also had these uh, uh, maps of the various continents, right, at, at certain stages in Earth's yeah. history on it. This was on the plaque in the movie. Yeah, yeah. on the Voyager um, 6, or V'ger 6, V'ger rather. 6, V'ger, yeah, 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 as they call it. Yeah. Now, there was a th- thing about that movie which was prescient, uh, and it's interesting in that 
what the people in the movie detect, uh, discover, and interact with is not a living thing. It's a c oh, computer. Yeah. yeah. And at the time, that seemed like a pretty outlandish idea. But uh, as time has gone on, we've, we've come to realize more and more that, uh, that um, machines are the wave of the future for living things. And in fact, the first intelligent thing we may detect will be not a, a living carbon unit, as they call it, but a, a mechanical or electronic computer. Yeah, I mean, to that point, you know, how do you think uh, we would react uh, if we discover if we discovered a space probe uh, that was not from Earth? You know, how essentially if we discovered a golden record sent by some long mm -hmm. gone civilization, uh, David, do you have any I mean, thoughts on I mean, how yeah. we would react? I mean, I think that's that's you know one of those sort of uh, you know momentous events that that you know it's it's very difficult to imagine um what that could mean for culture um or society um i'd be excited to listen to it yeah. <laughs> i bet there's some some uh, great music, music yeah. some far out music on that um you know but i think that that you know one of the things that we have to remember is that um the work that that you know SETI does, and and you know, uh, um, in continuing this search is incredibly important because if we don't listen, um, we're not going to hear anything. And you know, I think that that it, I, I've recently read that there's just such a small amount of uh, uh, what can't could be listened to or for for signal has actually been scanned. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just infinitesimal. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very tiny amounts. And, yeah, uh, people often say, uh, you've been searching for years and you haven't found anything. Why don't you give up? You did. But the answer is we have hardly looked, which is what David was just saying. We've looked at very few uh, radio channels or light channels and looked at very few stars. So we should not have succeeded. But we, uh, this thing we're dealing with is a big lottery. And so far, we've bought about two tickets. And <laughs> we, we need a lot yeah. more. You know, the other thing I think it's worth talking about a little bit is this idea that, you know, there have been a lot of discussions, Stephen Hawking talked about it, others, you know, that warning us against sending messages out and, and you know, alerting people where we are. And I remember there was some complete misreporting of, of uh, information about the Pulsar map. Don't tell them where we're located. And, you know, something that... that Annie Drian said to me, at, you know, when we were working on this project, really stuck with me, which was that, you know, it's really hard to imagine that a civilization that's as advanced enough um, to be able to, you know, have the technology to travel the distance, um, you know, to Earth would be so, you know, socially stunted as to want to come here and destroy us. <laughs> you know, it just seems unlikely. I, I will say, if they do want to come here and destroy us, I at least hope I'm around to see that happen. But yeah, well, I feel like Frank, we've had discussions about this before, and, and uh, I I don't know if uh, this is still your answer, but I feel like sometimes when we've discussed about aliens actually reaching us, uh, you've said, well, the big thing keeping them from doing that is actually just physics. Uh, you know, yes. space is really really big, yeah. and even if you're traveling exactly at light speed. Uh, it'd be hard to reach us from a lot of locations. Yes. <clears throat> it, we really don't comprehend in our imaginations or our, our thinking how vast space is. It is enormous. And if you're going to talk about going from one world to another, you've got to go at some good fraction of the speed of light or it takes so long that everybody's dead when they get there and what good is that? And uh, it's also a very hazardous journey. And so space acts actually as a quarantine, which prevents us from interfering or damaging or hurting or anything with other civilizations. So space but, itself is the prime directive, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that, That's of course, in that, they, that point is always lost in science fiction because, you know, you've got, you've got to meet the aliens and do stuff all within an right, hour. So that's why they have wormholes and light speed and, <laughs> yeah. and you know, hyperdrives. But yeah, I mean, I, I even think about it that, you know, uh, uh, Voyager uh, 1 is, what, 13 billion miles away or close to it now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Voyager just, 2 is just... 
just about to you know maybe yeah. starting to cross towards go, going to interstellar space and i mean that's taken 40 years and it's a tremendous distance but it's still incredibly close to where we are when you think about us in terms of you know the next star yeah well talking about the the movie uh, it's interesting so the movie came out in 1979 so very shortly after Vo the voyager probes were launched um you know and i it's something that uh i was curious about uh specifically for for you frank since you were really living uh uh you know, during this whole experience, did you get a sense that the Voyager probes were culturally significant to people outside of the scientific community? And so that's why it got incorporated into this movie? Or was this movie sort of an outlier and most people didn't really uh, value the Voyagers? Uh, <clears throat> I think the people couldn't va value the Voyagers because none of the com message content was in the movie. None of the pictures and all that. The record itself, I think, it does convey a great deal about us, and just the act of putting it together makes us think about what's important about us and uh, what's special and what's good and what's bad. And uh, so even though it may never be seen by other creatures, it's a very educational for our own selves. Yeah, I think the, the idea that it's this, you know, Yes, it's a gift from humanity to the cosmos, um, but it's also a gift to humanity. Yeah, yeah. You know, or in that sense, as a as a you know futurist, it makes me think about you know long term future artifacts. This makes us think about our long term future and and you know what humanity is capable of. Um, yeah, and, and what's important to us because part of this whole story is that the Voyager record will probably outlive all of humanity, in fact, our civilization, because the sun will swallow up the earth uh, be, be, uh, about the same time as the Voyager may be captured somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the only evidence that we ever existed. And uh, once you have that in your mind, you think, oh, I've got to be very careful what I put on it to make it a, as thorough and correct picture of our civilization and history as possible. That's yeah. what Tim, Tim Ferriss said, Ed, who was the uh, um, producer of the original record yeah. um, and who was my advisor in grad school. I remember him telling me, and he wrote it in the liner notes for our project, that the Voyagers are really, you know, they're on a journey through space, but they're also on a journey through time. Um, and I think that's, that's quite moving if you, if you really yeah, And they're survivors. That's, yeah. Yeah, so on the journey for, through time, so both of you have had such a, a very uh, intimate relationship with knowing everything that's on this record and well being you know part of creating it. Uh, if if there was a modern day release of it, uh, meaning uh, something that uh, looked at any changes at all uh, uh, in humanity uh, from the last several uh, decades since its release, would there be anything that you would add to it uh, that it doesn't already have on it um you know i think it obviously you both have done a fantastic job with uh uh working on it and frank with you originally on it um but is there anything that you would add if you had a chance to do a, a voyager 3 golden record uh undoubtedly it could be more comprehensive for instance there are some aspects of our civilization that are not present at all uh, for instance uh in the pictorial uh, presentation of life on Earth, there's no dentist. There's no lawyer. Uh, that part of our lives are still a secret. And there are many things like that. And actually, when I think about what would have happened if we had not a vinyl disc, but a CD to send. With a CD, you can send the whole Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, it would be an, either a nightmare or a blessing. A blessing because you needn't do no work at all, just send the encyclopedia. Or a blessing, no, well, that's a blessing. A nightmare because you had the opportunity to put literally thousands or millions of images on there and, and the work that would have to be done to pick out a, the thousand ideal messages is just uh, unthinkable. I mean, I th yeah, but I, I, I agree with that. But I do think that, you know, um, 
I don't think when when I hear people complaining, um, you know, oh well, you know, the Voyager record was missing this and it didn't include that. To me, it's it doesn't feel like it was meant to be, you know, and I didn't create it, but the story of life on Earth, mm -hmm. more of a story of life on Earth, and in that way, it's kind of like a piece of conceptual art, really, um, you know. I, and also the question of I think just even the very fact that it's a it's a, a, a copper phonograph record is significant because yes you could put a CD on there it's much more complicated to explain how to play a CD yeah. and also we don't know um, how long a CD can last for but right. you know this Maybe. is a pure physical you know media it, it'll 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 stand the test of time literally yeah. I mean, so something that I was also interested in was uh, the fact that, again, this, this movie had such a close tie. It's science fiction, but it has such a close tie to things that are actually taking place. David, do you feel like sci-fi today is, is uh, more or less sort of incorporating of real life space exploration, just subjectively? I mean, you know, subjectively, I think that... Um, you know, movies, I, I prefer, as far as science fiction goes, movies like um, 2001, which is one of my favorite movies, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I think is an incredible um, extraterrestrial, um, you know, uh, uh, film. Um, I'm less interested in these sort of like aliens come to Earth and we have to do battle with them. Um, again, it just doesn't seem that interesting to me, even if it is exciting. But... Um, I think that that Star Trek film, I think some other films from that era, Close Encounters, even 2001, which was long before, um, had a lot to unpack um, intellectually. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I, I tend to prefer that direction in, in, in filmmaking rather than, you know, yeah. to see simple plots that are just really vehicles to feed you advanced special effects and explosions. Just cowboys and Indians in, in astronaut space. suits. Right. <laughs> so my my final question yeah. for both of you. Uh, so uh, in the film, you know, we see V'ger six, Voyager six. Uh, it's you know gone through a black hole. It came out the other side, and it uh, you know encountered a, a machine uh, intelligence civilization. Uh, my final question for both of you is: If we, as a society, got to the point where we were launching a Voyager six, so we launched three, four, five, and now we're launching a Voyager six, where would you want it to go? So, advanced future Voyager six. I think <clears throat> right now we're launching a number of new missions, which are going to search for planets with life on them. And that will probably, in the next two, few decades, lead us to knowing of planets where there could very well be creatures like us, and that's where we should send them. So it's too soon, but that, that, that's the way the game should be played. Yeah, yeah maybe, the, uh, maybe to Europa. Right. Yeah, Europa, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Europa's a good one. Yeah, you know, but I mean, one thing to remember about Voyagers is that they, they weren't, they're not going anywhere in particular. Um, at this point, they're just drifting, you know, in orbit, you know, among the stars, you know. So that's where you would want them to sort of continue going for Voyager 6? Um, well, no, I mean, I think oh. if we had more information about where there was something likely to be happening, if the goal of the Voyager mission was to seek out life as opposed to, um, you know, image the planets and, and, you know, it depends on what the, what the aim is. Yeah, which we, is, we should yeah. go to go to any planet that has strong evidence of advanced life quickly Qu yeah. quickly yeah I think that's a good answer and with a smile <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you both so much for being on the show thank you I'm always honored to be sitting next to Frank oh <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really awesome, Ariel. Uh, it's, it's really clear that both Frank and David are huge science fiction fans and have this direct connection to something in 
a seminal science fiction film, Star Trek Motion Picture. Yeah, I really think that, you know, Frank's work uh, on the Golden Record and, and actually getting all of these pictures and all these cultural items onto this Voyager space probe really had a massive effect on perhaps this movie even being made because Voyager has this very human characteristic that you sort of see throughout the Star Trek uh, motion picture movie. And I think that came from a lot of the work that went into actually creating this golden record and making it representative of humanity. And, and that's exactly it. The sentiment that both of them express in recording and something that is echoed in the movie is that the record and the fake plaque that's in the film, it's really a reflection on humanity as much as it is this outward facing artifact of the message you want to send to any extra terrestrials. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, speaking of artifacts, so uh, we talked to David Peskovitz during uh, our discussion, and he did this uh, release of the first vinyl version of the Golden Record. So people can actually still get that today uh, if you go to ozmarecords.com. Uh, the artifact, if you are looking at the uh, YouTube stream, looks like this. And it's a great way to rediscover or discover for the very first time what is on that record and why it's so culturally significant. I want to thank both our guests for joining this week, uh, as well as you out there for listening. And if you just like listening to the audio version, we do have Offworld as a podcast now. You can find it at tested.com slash Offworld, where we'll have more episodes in the near future. Once again, thanks for listening.